treated in distinct ways by Nielsen. Right? To have a right to any share at all of something like a blood transfusion, you have to need it. Mere preferences are not enough. All right, so now let's go fully back to the needs part, part two of principle two. Uh, as Nielsen puts it, the satisfaction of a given, a given person's needs must, as far as possible, be compatible with other people being able to similarly so satisfy their needs. Okay? Now, that gives rise to kind of a puzzle. Right? As Nielsen puts it, how does justice as equality work? Right? That's his name for his view. How does justice as equality work? where it's impossible to give equal shares. How would we realize principle two uh, with something that we can't give equal shares to everybody of? Right, so let's continue with Nielsen's example of the blood transfusion. Suppose that two people need it, but they can't both have a blood transfusion, either because there's not enough blood or there's not enough doctors and nurses and stuff around to perform a procedure or whatever. So only one person can have the blood transfusion. How does justice and equality work in this situation where we have to ration care? Well, he says there's lots of things we can do. He says maybe we should flip a coin. Or we can look at the two, the two candidates and give the blood transfusion to the person who has contributed more blood in, in the past. Or we could give it, decide to give it to the person who can probably go on to live a longer life. Or we can give it to the person who we predict could offer more of value to the community going forward. Okay, now according to Nielsen, any of these methods is compatible with his second principle. Okay, now here's an exercise for all of you. Try to explain why. Why does he think that any of those ways of kind of uh, deciding who gets the blood transfusion is consistent with these demands for equality? Okay, try to figure that out. Uh, here's another exercise for you. How do we currently make such choices in cases like this? Well, as I understand it, it's often a kind of combination of a number of different uh, criteria that we use. Uh, but more generally, right, how do we distribute scarce resources? Right? I mean, sometimes we just do it in terms of ability to pay. Right, who has more money gets it. Now that would be incompatible with Nielsen's egalitarianism. That would be incompatible with justice as equality. But he says that these other options or some kind of combination of them would be compatible with his view. So yeah, exercise. Try to explain why and try to compare that to what we do now. All right. So that's a kind of a rough explanation of what Nielsen actually means by his first and second principle, right? We should be worried about authority because authorities, uh, sorry, because authority and hierarchies can threaten liberty, right? That's an, uh, something that he talked about that Rawls didn't talk about much. And then for principle two, right, we want to make it so that everybody has a right to an equal share of the common social product once we, you know, pay attention to meeting different people's different needs and provide for social goods like uh, parks and hospitals and roads, but also um, capital overhead for preserving our productive capacity into the future. Um, and that's when we talked about what it means for different people to have a right to an equal share. All right, all right, all right. So, okay, that's what Nielsen takes his principles to entail. Now, why does he think that we should accept those principles, except especially the second principle. In particular, why does he think we should prefer his second claim to Rawls's difference principle? He says, my claim is that given our mutual commitment to equal self-respect and equal moral autonomy in conditions of moderate scarcity, equal self-respect and equal moral autonomy require something like my second principle for their attainability. This is the key idea. Right? Put somewhat differently, the key idea is that equal self-respect and autonomy require more or less equal material conditions. Now let's I want to focus on this for a minute. It says equal self-respect and equal moral autonomy require something like my second principle for their attainability. Right? The key idea, Nielsen's key idea, is that equal self-respect and autonomy require equal material conditions, more or less. 
Okay, so another way he puts it is this. He says, there are circumstances where Rawls' second principle is satisfiable, where equal liberty and equal self-respect are not obtainable, right, because of these inequalities. Right, in short, I shall argue, his first and second principles clash. Right, now, this is an interesting way to phrase his objection because ne uh, Nozick put a very similar, put one of his objections to Rawls, the priority of liberty objection, in a very similar way. Right, so uh, from both Nozick and Nielsen, who are obviously coming from very different starting points, we get this, they each put this pressure on Rawls to explain how his two principles, A and B there on your screen, fit together. Right, uh, Nielsen's going to, or sorry, Nozick's going to say that if we take A seriously, B doesn't really do anything, right? We can't really enact the policies that would be required to make B a reality if we take A seriously. And Nielsen says something kind of similar, right? He says that if we're going to get the same equal liberty and self-respect as a, Rawls wants to capture with principle A, uh, then we're not going to be able to allow for the inequalities that B allows for. So another way that Nielsen puts the point is he says Rawls, on his interpretation of the second principle, allows inequalities which undermine any effective application of the equal liberty principle. Right? The idea is that if we allow for the large inequalities of wealth and income that the difference principle might allow for, we're not going to be able to preserve equal self-respect and equal autonomy. All right. This is Nielsen's key objection to Rawls. Now, why does Nielsen believe this, this stuff? Right, this is the important stuff. Why does he believe it? Now, I'm not going to just tell you what I think the answer is. You should. Uh, you need to read and reread this Nielsen article carefully and reflect on it deeply. Nielsen says many helpful things throughout his article, but you might need to read between the lines a bit to really get the idea. But here's another way of asking the question, and hopefully thinking about it in these terms might be useful, might help jog something loose. Why well, think that equal consideration might at least sometimes require equality of condition? Right? We've already seen that equal consideration doesn't always require equal treatment or equal rights, but why might it be impossible, at least sometimes, to show equal consideration to A and B if A and B are in significantly different social or material circumstances. Okay, so that's my the general question here. Right? Okay, so think, think about that, read about it, and then let me know what the answer is. All right, so now let's get back to a direct comparison between Nielsen and Rawls. So this graph is going to be very important going forward, right? Because this is the one that Nielsen roughly, Nielsen and Rawls would disagree roughly about this one, right? Where Nielsen, you know, putting the stuff about differing needs for different people aside, right, Nielsen's going to say that if these are the two options for how we can arrange our society or the society's fundamental institutions to generate one or other of these distributions, right, Nielsen is going to say that the one on the left is preferable, whereas Rawls is going to say the one on the right is preferable, right, basically. All right, so Nielsen's objection to Rawls, given this dispute, is that to really realize equal liberty in a way that allows for equal self-respect and equal, equal autonomy, we need equality of condition, right? as that's specified in Nielsen's second principle, and as is not compatible with Rawls' difference principle. All right, that's Nielsen's basic objection to Rawls. All right, now for the next several slides, we're going to talk about the back and forth here, the, the argument between these two people, because then we'll get a better sense of each of their views and the strengths and weaknesses of them. Okay, so Rawls' initial response is to say, look, an equal division of primary goods is irrational in view of the possibility of bettering everyone's circumstances by accepting certain inequalities. Right, that was just Rawls' initial argument for the distribution on the right instead of the distribution on the left, right? The distribution on the right has everyone doing better off and nobody doing worse off. So according to Rawls' system, it would be irrational to choose equality to the preferable uh, one on the right. All right. Now, this is also a version of what's called the leveling down objection to egalitarianism. 
And we're going to come back to that in one of the last slides of the slideshow. All right, so what's Nielsen's response to this obvious Rawlsian rejoinder? So here's one thing that Nielsen says. He says, the difference principle tells us that if the worst off will be better off, that is better off in monetary terms, they should accept the inequality. The rub, however, is in Rawls's understanding of better off, or improving the position of the worst off. He caches these notions in purely monetary terms. This prompts the response that either this is too narrow a notion of being better off, or, this is important, we are not justified in believing that rational agents who have a tolerably adequate conception of fairness will always give first priority to being better off. They might very well, in conditions of moderate scarcity, recognize other things to be of greater value. It is a very, very important part of Nielsen's response to Rawls. Right? What Nielsen imagines here is that, look, if we're really given these two options as represented by those two graphs on the left there, it's not just obviously irrational to choose equality, right? We don't just care about having certain numbers of things. We also care about relating to our fellow society members in certain ways. And the equal distribution might allow us to do that. Okay, so this, 